So on the back of your sheet right now is a copy of the syllabus that you see up on the slide there. And this is hard, right? This is actually, because you don't know, as, as, as they were saying, you don't know what the disabilities of your learners are because they may not show them. And they may not be willing to come up to you and say, oh, by the way, I struggle with this or I have this challenge. So and it's impossible to anticipate what exactly they are. And so the beautiful thing about universal design is it's like, it's almost like I don't even care. Well, I'm just going to do something that will help everybody. And, and whether you have a disability or not, or to what extent you have a disability, it helps. So it helps all the learners, which is kind of the, the thing that, um, the way that I like to hear about it is, it's not special treatment, it's just better teaching. Um, but it's hard because you can't just stand and talk, you have to integrate stuff. So the challenge for the day is um, looking at the World War II history, and we've got the three main learning objectives. Um, your sheet talks about the modes that they were talking about, the representation, the expression, and the engagement. Engagement, thank you. <laughs> so engaging the learners right away, what are the hooks for them? And how can you get them onto that line so we can reel them in and, and make them smarter, right? Um, and how do we do that? In, so we've got some things for you to, to look through. And I'm going to ask you to think about, you know, if you can't think of your own class, which ideally you think about your own class, but if you can't, use a World War II example. We all know a little bit about World War II. And if not, we can glean some information from the Google or from the, the syllabus. And think about how would you engage students in that class? How would you, what are the different ways that you can have your students um, show their knowledge and assess their learning? Uh, and, how would, and would you be able to assess their learning then? Like that's one of the issues. Are your rubrics going to be flexible enough that they can do whatever format they want? And if, you, if they're not, if your rubrics are not flexible enough, should they be? Or are you channeling them into a specific way um, that, that privileges one way of, of, of showing knowledge over another one? Uh, and then expression, oh, rep rep representation. So what are the different ways that you can use to, to share that knowledge about World War II? All right, so let's take like 10 minutes and, and think about that and write some stuff down. There is a Canvas course that you should all have an invitation to in your email right now. Um, if you'd like to do it there, that's great. I don't think we need to. Um, and it might actually be distraction, a distraction to, to go on there. But if you feel comfortable in Canvas and you want to try to figure that out. Um, the idea of the topic for today was to think about this for online learning. So. It's harder sometimes for online learning because it's in this sort of, it's both a blessing and a curse. It's in a digital format and it lets us do more asynchronous stuff. Um, and yet it's also harder to engage to get that feedback. Um, and that note, oh, excuse me, the note page, you can jump onto that too. Let just bring up all that, that very first page. APL, UDL, uh, Bitly, no, that's a fun one to get on. There are a bunch of resources already populated on that. Slides there that we talked about, and then the link to the, the sharing sheet, which actually you should be able to just edit through there. But if you click on that, you should be able to get into the, the Google Doc. 
primary sources. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 Ye
time that you went behind the screen. You, know? <laughs> you were there, but we couldn't see you. Right? So that's a, that's a really interesting point. Like the multiple means of representation are not just audio, visual, yeah, yeah, whatever, right, but they right. can also be like metaphor and story yeah. and yeah. other sort of emotional connections. Excellent. Other thoughts? John? Well, one thing with history is, is uh, primary sources, right? And so, but they can be very boring, at least in the initial presentation. Oh, I gotta read and all that. So an idea that I had is to kind of bring it to modern times, because that's oftentimes what we're talking about with history too, is to understand it in sort of modern terms, what's going on now. But I thought about something like social media, Twitter, or like even texting, where you have to be very short. So maybe asking the learners to go in and look at these primary sources and uh, see what that might look like in a series of tweets because now they have to get into the heart of the primary sources, right? Yeah. And so actually I was thinking too, one thing I mentioned in our little group here is that that might just in general be a good way to help our learners learn how to read for the, the main points there and be really concise about in yeah. their expression. So maybe um, <coughs> getting ready for writing a paper, for example, right? That that might be a way to, to have them get to the point, and then from there, then they can write their, their paper on those main points. And Jamie Hankey did this in, for her music education. She had her students um, all take on the persona of a different composer, historical composer, throughout the ages, but then they would have to re write back and forth to each other via, I think it was on Ning at the time that she was using it. She was trying it several different ways. Was that, was that also limited to like the number of characters and all that? She, she did limit it, and that is another really good point because we, we talk about how do we get them to get the point and to be concise in their writing mm -hmm. instead of spewing out four pages of something where maybe there's something in that. You have to point at the end. Eventually, at the, at the end, or well, in between the first and twelfth paragraph. And what was going on in my mind with the like primary sources thing is that you go in and you have to read for the point, right? To, to be able to think about how you're going to write that in this series of concise tweets. Yeah. For example. And find the context within that point as well. It's yeah. a difficult task. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Janet? Well, there's a, with the National World War II <coughs> Museum, where it's a site where there's uh, oral histories and there's artifacts. I mean, it's just filled with different ways to connect with the audience. Yeah. I think that'd be really cool. It, and from like Pearl Harbor, from a Japanese point of view, from a Medal of Honor, I mean, they, they've got all these people that are actually interviewed in a cool way. Yeah, and, and making the connection, like yeah. even then to say, oh, grandfather or whatever was involved yeah. in, in that so that then it becomes a, a family connection the the ways to um, to grab their attention initially and get them involved is, is that would the be real people oral stories yeah. stories are so powerful yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. other thoughts say it, Julie. Anything? Well, another kind of follow-up to what I was thinking with the social media thing is that if you do that as sort of an activity in the class you know, reading a primary source, that that could also be getting them ready for, like, at the end of the course, one of the ways they can do their final piece to show their understanding, you know, one of the options they can choose from is to do another similar, like, series of tweets kind of thing, or however you set that up. So you've already, you've already taught them how to do that, and then, therefore, they're more informed about that choice when they have to do their final project. Yeah. And oftentimes, like, by letting them choose their own project, Oftentimes the instructor can be like, oh, that's cool. I didn't know about that. And they teach you, which yeah. makes them feel cool, and you keep praise on them so they feel even better about learning and about your class. And, and then they become you a come back years later and talk about it. I remember when you get behind that screen. So the one question I have, I like the idea of giving students sort of choices in terms of the sort of final assignment, if you will. But I'm just wondering about um, sort of the rubric because oftentimes when you give assignments you provide a rubric and so if um, how, how do you do that that's so that was the part that really stuck me because it's different like a rubric for a paper is different generally mm -hmm. different for a rubric for a series of tweets yeah, right. different for a rubric for a video but does it have to be like what are the things that are common among all of them what are the actual enduring understandings that you want mm -hmm. them to Get. And if you can capture those in the rubric, 
-hmm. it, like the bigger concepts should be rubricable. <laughs> um, and the little things like, you know, did you capitalize all of your first letters and that punctuation right? That's trickier. Now, is that important? It depends on what class you have. So, the moment in, I mean, if it's a writing class, maybe you're going to have a, a written paper that would make sense instead of a, mm -hmm. a, a video or something like that. But, I don't know. What Other is, thoughts on that? Yeah. You could do is tell the student, make the rubric. Oh, oh yeah. yeah! And su submit it to me. And you need to submit it to me a month before the assignment is due. And then you review it, and uh -huh. is this in line when uh -huh. it's showing the integrity of uh, okay. you have achieved the same grade doing this video as someone who wrote the paper, uh -huh. and is it linking back to those learning objectives? And that is, uh, having students write rubrics is great, because that gets them involved in the process right. and right. Uh, the metacognition and the thinking of like, well, what am I learning? How am I representing what I'm right. learning? And it puts their, gives them a chance to be in your shoes for just a little bit as well. Right. Right. And it makes less work for you, so. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'll be amazed how hard they are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. right. Yeah. right. That's true. That's a good yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. Because these students are always hard on themselves. Uh, they're, so they're, they're, they're soften the, <laughs> the rubric a little bit. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. That's very helpful. Other thoughts on this? Other thoughts on how to do this online? Or in a blended format? Well, I was thinking blend, and this was just really a chance interaction that I had with one of my colleagues. So I went to Japan this summer for a conference, and uh, I learned how to say thank you in Japanese, so I'm always doing that, and I bow, and I say arigato. Um, so I happened to be having a conversation with a co-worker, and I thanked her in, in Japanese, and she said, oh, uh, you speak Japanese? And I said, well, I only know how to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then we started chatting some, and she said, you know, my dad was, um, was an, uh, my dad is a veteran, and he served in, in Japan, and she was telling me about that experience growing up with him as a child. And so as I'm sitting here thinking about this, I thought, you know, if I was sort of doing a, a, a blend course and, you know, we were focusing on these issues, I would invite her to come in and then create an active learning assignment where the students would interview her about her dad's experience and share her dad's story. But then also, because I'm a psychologist and it's all about mental health, then I would have them also interview her in terms of what was life like for you growing up with a dad who was actively serving. Mm -hmm. So this occurred to me. Just in the um, design, for, I, I just taught a online, fully online lesson last week. I wasn't in my class. And to prepare it, it took a lot of preparation. I had to be very thoughtful and very explicit about the directions I was giving, mm -hmm. how they should be reading the directions, using signposts, and my signposts are symbols, like it's a book. This is where you read. And ensuring that when I'm doing that, I'm not just using bold or using different colors, but actually using headings. I don't think any of my students use a screen reader. I asked them at the beginning of the semester, but I have no idea. They might be. Um, and well, just with that, having the picture of the book, yep. plus so you've got the image and the text, and they're reinforcing each other. But one of the things I think that I asked them yesterday, I'm like, how did you, how did you do with that? I mean, some students really don't like learning online. Did you think it was kind of a a pain. I actually asked them if they, th I thought it was, they thought it was a pain in the butt. They laughed. They're like, no, I don't think it, they didn't think it was a pain in the butt. And I think one of the things I did was front load. These are the expectations I'm going to have you, want you to do. And this is how you should be doing this online. So this is, notice there's a lot, going to be a lot more reading. Notice you have to pay attention to the directions. Notice you have to give yourself enough time. So all those little cues about how you can be successful and front load that um, way to be successful prior to it. Yeah. That makes me think about um, when Morton Gernsbacher talks about um, sharing primary sources, she mm -hmm. will actually go through and on the first one, and maybe the first and second one, and highlight for them, this is the important part, these are the important parts. Yeah. As a way to sort of model, like, as an expert, this is how I read. 
I look at that first, I look at that part. This other stuff is not as important, so think about why is this important, and why is this not important, and, or as important, and, and having that model for the first couple of sources then sets them up for the next ones. So the, the, the showing them, telling them what they need to do to think about this. And also, the, the, um, I, when we're giving them homework or content that they need to be bringing and ready to do, to do something with in class, which is you know part of the blended piece of it, we, I like to tell them what they're going to be doing with that content in class. This is what the assignment's going to be, and this is how you're going to be using it, and there's an expectation that you'll be able to do these things with this content. And then it takes a lot of extra work to, to do that, but, but class is so much better because they're not just sitting there like mumps because they didn't do their reading. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're, or they're, or I have podcasts. So they're they stress for them as well because yeah. they don't know what you expect. Mm -hmm. so that, so much of a student's life is spent guessing what the teacher wants. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. You so show them how it's going to be useful for them. It right. becomes yeah. that much more yeah. useful. Yeah. So that's great. Give those clear instructions about how this is going to help you later. Mm -hmm. Great. And I think doing that on a regular basis, mm -hmm. because as instructors, we do that, you know, the first day of class, right? Because that's when you do the whole right. overview, if right. you will. But then from midterm, they forgot about that. You so we get back to it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Reinforcement, distributed learning, coming back over and over and over again to the main points. It is time. It is the end of the, the end of the session. I, I don't want to take up any more of your time. So, they help me thank Michael and Ruben, please. And, awesome. and please um, take a moment to fill out our little yellow evaluations and come back here. Bring a friend. And bring a buddy, yeah! <laughs>